Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's show is a little bit different. I'm going to feature cases that are very strange. And in fact, the title of this episode is Incredibly Odd. 10 Very Strange Encounters with UFOs and Extraterrestrials. So that's the theme I'd like to explore. Yes, the UFO phenomenon is strange. It has a lot of high strangeness. We know that. But some cases are really off the charts with this. Some cases have absolutely unique and super bizarre features to them. And that's the cases, the kinds of cases I'd like to focus on today. I have 10 cases coming from all over the world. In fact, from Canada, across the United States, South America, across Europe, uh, from Australia as well. Again, this shows that this is a global phenomenon. These are cases that start all the way back to the 1930s up to 2013. So that's a span of more than 100 years. Many of these cases do involve multiple witnesses. That's always important because it strengthens the credibility of a case. Many of them do involve some really compelling physical evidence. And again, the entire range that we often see. So we have animal reactions. We have some very unusual electromagnetic disturbances. We have landing traces. We have certainly medical or physiological effects, some very strange emotional or spiritual aspects to some of these cases as well. But again, some super unique cases. And these cases do cover the entire range. There's quite a few actual landings, several involving, of course, humanoids as well. And each case, I think, provides some really interesting insights particularly because they are unique. And the first case I'd like to talk about, I call something not of this earth. What I like about this case is it's a very early case from the 1930s. The witness had never even heard of UFOs and it took him years to comprehend that this was probably in fact an encounter with a UFO, a landed UFO as it turns out. And this case was investigated by a professional researcher. So I think you'll find it quite interesting. This case took place in 1933 in Cherryville, Pennsylvania. Again, it's a very early and very odd account, which comes from researcher George Fawcett, who's very well respected in this field. The main witness is a young gentleman. He was 18 years old. And he was driving from Nazareth, Pennsylvania to Lehighton, Pennsylvania in his 1925 Ford Roadster. It was a summer morning. It was around 2.30 a.m. And he was at a lonely spot on the road somewhere between Moorestown and Cherryville, he says, when he got a flat tire. And he began to change his tire. And this is when something very strange happened. Now, the witness described what happened in his own words in quite some detail, so I will just quote him directly. As he says, I noticed a faint violet or purplish light in the field on my right. It was not especially bright, but the peculiarity of the hue made me curious. I walked 200 feet toward the light. On the grass lay a bell-shaped object about 10 feet in diameter and about 6 feet high. Light was issuing from a slit on the object, which proved to be a circular door, slightly ajar, on close examination. This door was about a foot in diameter. When I pushed it, it swung open. It was constructed somewhat like a bank vault door with ceiling steps on its edges and at the opening. There was nobody around, so I put my head inside. But because of the peculiar light, Apparently coming from the ceiling, I had difficulty seeing. The chamber was full of tubing and dials with a kind of console in the center. There were no perceivable windows. The chamber was about six feet in diameter and about four feet high, and it had a dome. I could see no beds or seats. But I remember the walls had a striated pattern like that of marble. 
Since I was able to put my head through the door directly into the chamber, the object apparently had no airlock. The odor in the chamber was similar to ammonia, and the temperature was quite cold. The shapes of several small objects in the chamber had strange curves, unlike anything I had ever seen before or since. I withdrew my head and walked around the object. There were no windows visible on the outside either, nor could I see any person or creature. The outside surface of the object was extremely smooth, metallic in texture as I recall, and solid to the touch. While inspecting the object, I neither saw nor heard any living thing. In fact, the silence was deadly, but it's entirely possible I was observed. I walked back to the car after 10 minutes of examining the object and went home. So some very unusual aspects there. The witness didn't see the object arrive, nor did he see it leave. He had no idea what it was and at the time never considered it might be a UFO or a craft of any kind, uh, certainly not from another world. As the witness says, when I had this experience, I had never heard of a flying saucer and hadn't the remotest idea what the object was. But now, looking back, I am convinced I saw something not of this earth and perhaps not even of our planetary system. So the fact that the witness describes this object as having very unusual lighting on the inside, this is something we do hear from a lot of experiencers. The unusual, all-encompassing silence is also quite common. And he really had no idea how to explain this. And looking back in hindsight, he wonders what kind of being could have piloted this object as the door itself was so narrow. So he also believes that this craft must have had an exotic method of propulsion beyond the use of propellants. He wonders if anyone else in the area saw this object, but apparently nobody did because all these years later, his testimony still stands alone. Yeah, and that comes from researcher George Fawcett, a very well-respected researcher, and is certainly an unusual case. I've only heard of a few that are anywhere like this one. So it's an important addition, I think, to the vast number of cases out there. And here's another really strange case, which I call Knocked Over by a UFO. This occurred on October 21st, 1963, in Trancas, Argentina, and there's some very interesting aspects about this case. One is that it involves a whole family, a large family, so it's certainly got multiple witnesses, and there are witnesses outside the family who also saw activity, but probably the most interesting thing about this case is the large amount of physical evidence surrounding it, pretty much across the entire range from animal reactions to medical effects, to some really compelling landing traces. But there's some very unusual and unique events that occurred during this encounter, which I think makes it worth being more widely known. It certainly did get a lot of attention in the area where it occurred. And a lot of researchers have looked at this case. It's quite an important case, I think. And also raises the question is, could this have been military, humans, us, as opposed to ETs. Well, we'll just take a look at the case and you can decide for yourself. Argentina has provided quite a few encounters. Um, this encounter from Trancas, Argentina, though, is definitely one of the biggest in the area. This case was investigated by researcher Oscar Galindez, and he calls it, quote, one of the most exceptional occurrences in the whole history of the UFO phenomenon. So this began around 9.30 p.m., again on October 21, 1963, when Senora Yoli Moreno, her sister Yolanda, their children and parents were in their bedrooms preparing for bed when the maid Dora interrupted them and told Yoli and Yolanda very fearfully that strange lights were appearing outside 
by the Belgrano railway line, which was about 450 feet from their home. So they went outside to take a look, and at first they didn't see anything. But then the lights reappeared, and they could see two very bright lights landed on the ground. And looking at them, it was clear that these were actually craft. Later they would find out that these were disc-shaped craft. But between these two objects, they could see about 40 figures moving back and forth through this weird sort of tube of light. You can see the illustration here of what they saw. And they did notice that there were three other objects nearby, right alongside this railway line. And the sisters wondered at this point if there had been some sort of train derailment. Uh, it was quite cold, so they went back inside, got some warm clothes, and went back outside to investigate. And this is when the whole family started to wake up and realize something unusual was going on. Because their sister, Argentina, woke up and looked outside and screamed. Because she saw that there were, in fact, several strange objects, disc-shaped, and one was very, very close to the house. And when she screamed, she woke up the rest of the people in the house. And now, the maid, Dora, and the two sisters, Yoli and Yolanda, could see this disc, which was right next to the house. It had six portholes around the bottom of it. And as they watched, this object began to rotate. And at the same time, it became surrounded by this strange mist. Things were just beginning, because suddenly the disc emitted this powerful flame, which violently hurled their bodies about six feet down to the ground. I mean, it threw them to the ground, knocked them over. Dora, who was closest and standing in front of the sisters, actually suffered first and second degree burns and had to be treated at the hospital. Yoli and Yolanda felt only a blast of heat, but they were not burned. But at this point, all the other objects lit up. There were a total of six of them, and they lit up brightly enough to illuminate the entire property. This first and closest disc rotated so fast, it became kind of a blur, surrounded by an orange mist. But at the same time, it emitted a tube of light about 10 feet wide, which began to shine all over the house and the property, as though conducting some kind of a thorough search. At one point, this beam seemed to focus on the tractor shed. They thought that was un really unusual, and the next day afterwards, they found that the oil marks on their tractor were gone, as if washed away. Now, this beam of light was not normal. It would stretch slowly outward, kind of like a feeler, a coherent beam of light, Clearly not a normal beam of light. And curious at one point, because Yolanda thought, you know, what is this? Is this a jet stream of some kind? She stuck her arm into the beam of light. She felt a powerful sensation of heat, and this light beam seemed to penetrate right through her arm. So she wasn't even making a shadow. This, of course, caused her to become quite fri frightened, and she and the others retreated back to the house. And this is when, you know, this UFO and apparently the others were sending down all kinds of beams of light to each other and on the house. And in fact, the others in the house began praying as beams of light started targeting various portions of the house, sometimes the people themselves. At the beginning of this incident, the temperature in the house had been about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but now the temperature quickly rose to over 100 degrees. It was about 104, they think. Uh, their dogs, who were normally very protective, never barked and seemed almost dazed. And the same was true with the chickens in the hen house. Now the family was checking on everyone. They had some very young children who were sleeping in their beds through the whole incident. But when they went to check on them, their children were now sweating so profusely from the heat that their bedclothes were drenched with per perspiration. So these beams of light were shining into the house, making it as bright as daylight. And it's not clear, but according to the witnesses' descriptions, it seems as though these beams of light themselves came right through the walls. And... All, everyone was running around in the house trying to avoid these beams, 
which were occasionally targeting them specifically. And this went on for a long time, about 40 minutes. Finally, the object did leave, the objects. The family went outside to investigate and saw that this mist from the object still hung thickly in the air. It had a strong smell of sulfur. And below, where this object, the close one, had hovered, they found a circle of ground completely covered with these little white spheres. I mean, it was piled high, three feet high, with these little white spheres. They were quite delicate and crumbly. They found others near the railway where the other objects had been. But these little spheres, yeah, were very delicate and crumbled under the least pressure. They were able to collect some of these and submit them to an analysis. They were analyzed by Walter Gonzalo at the Institute of Chemical Engineering at the University of Tucumán, and they were showed to be composed of calcium carbonate and potassium carbonate. So certainly unusual, but not necessarily of extraterrestrial com composition. Hard to say, because elements are same, the same all across the universe. But there were other witnesses, because turns out their neighbor, who lives right near to them, as you can see on the map, his name Francisco Tropiano, didn't see anything. But as he says, I didn't see the objects, but I did observe an orange glow that persisted for 30 minutes behind the Medina mountain range. Uh, and there were other witnesses in the area. Now, Yoli Moreno whose husband was in the Air Force, was contacted by the Argentine Navy and told to fill out a questionnaire about the encounter, which she learned was sent to the Pentagon in the United States. And reportedly, this was one of the cases that inspired Steven Spielberg's movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I think you'll agree that's a very compelling case, one that does deserve to be widely known. And it's interesting that this had such an effect to the point where maybe it actually did <laughs> inspire Steven Spielberg with Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I wasn't able to verify that completely, but that's what some people have said about this case. So who knows? Either way, it's an important case. And so is this next one, uh, because this has an element to it that I don't know that I've ever heard before. Uh, there are a lot of cases with very unusual beams of light or unusual electromagnetic effects. And this one is, as the title of this episode says, incredibly odd. I call this case UFO Benz Car Headlights. This occurred on April 4, 1966, near Ballarat, Australia. And it's created quite a sensation among UFO researchers also has kind of a dark element to it, a sort of unfortunate aftermath, which may or may not be related to this case, but again, you can make up your own mind about it. This case is not only incredibly odd, but as I said, it's got a dark, tragic side to it. It was on the evening of April 4, 1966, when Ron F. Sullivan, then a 38-year-old businessman, was driving outside the town of St. Arnaud on the Denoli St. Arnaud Road near Burke's Flat. This is near Ballarat, Australia. And he saw a glowing light in the field alongside the road. Now he assumed at first this was a tractor, but he's driving along at about 60 miles per hour, and as he gets close, something very strange happened. This weird light suddenly became much more brilliant, then, to his shock, his car headlights began to flicker, and then the beams of light themselves were suddenly pulled at a diagonal towards the light in the field, but at the same time, they bent back towards the road. In other words, instead of going straight, they turned right towards this object and then left back onto the road in one continuous beam. So with his headlights bending off into the field, he saw that this light, which he thought was a tractor, was actually a small, three-foot-wide white disc hovering right above the ground. And the closer he got to this disc, 
the more his headlights bent towards it. And I'll just quote Ron Sullivan directly, as he says, and I quote, Everything seemed to be in the form of light. Suddenly my headlights pulled hard over to the right for some unaccountable reason. Instead of lighting the road, they lit up the fence as though they were being attracted by a magnet. I braked as hard as I could and glanced over to the right. In the middle of the paddock was a column of colored light about 25 feet high and shaped like an ice cream cone. It would have been about 3 feet wide at the bottom and 10 feet wide at the top. Not far away, I saw a brilliant white disk, about three feet in diameter. The object was just above the ground, and from its upper surface, it projected a conical array of shimmering rainbow lights, extended to a height of about 15 feet. Then suddenly, the colored cone rose to a height of 20 feet, and the disk below climbed above it. In the next moment, the whole light complex vanished. So in another interview, he said, The headlights of my car were suddenly diverted to the right for no apparent reason, and had I followed them, I would have run off the straight stretch of road. So yeah, this road was going straight, and he very nearly had an accident. He is absolutely certain this disc was not natural and that it was intelligently controlled. And when his headlights bent off the road, he first thought that his car itself had veered off the road and into the field. So he automatically tried to correct his steering, only to find that he was now driving off the road to his left. So it was with great difficulty and quick reflexes that he managed to stay on the road and avoid an accident. But it really shook him up. He stopped his car and checked the lights, only to find that they were in working order. Whatever had happened to them, it was clear that the strange glowing disc was the cause. But as it was now gone, he continued his drive. But he was so upset, he didn't sleep at all that night. And he didn't really talk about it until he heard that there was, three days later, an accident in that same area. And that's when he reported his encounter. And he called the police about it, and he thought that would be the end of it, but it wasn't, because the police wanted him to go to the scene of this accident, which occurred two days after Ron's sighting on April 6. A 19-year-old man by the name of Gary Taylor collided into a tree and lost his life. It was a fatal car accident. And the police were very interested in Ron's report because the location of Gary's fatal accident was precisely where Ron had nearly had an accident himself when his headlights were bent by the UFO. So he went to the location where the police questioned him and they found a strange hole in the ground, three feet across, five inches deep, exactly where Ron had seen this hovering disc. There was sandy soil there, and it looked like it had been neatly scooped out. There were no other tracks or marks found in this area. Now, when Gary Taylor had his fatal accident, there was another vehicle driving about a half mile behind him, and they watched Gary's car swerve off the road for no apparent reason that they could see. Now, of course, the speculation is that the same thing that happened to Ron Sullivan happened to Gary Taylor, except that Gary T Taylor was not able to prevent an accident. Hard to say for sure, because there, there's no direct evidence connecting these two incidents, except for the fact that they occurred in exactly the same spot, and that Ron himself came very close to having an accident. But it's certainly interesting that this object bent uh, Ron's headlights. Because students of Albert Einstein know that powerful gravitational fields do actually bend light. They first noticed this when the light from stars near our sun were actually being bent. So could it be that this object exerted a magnetic field strong enough to actually bend light. 
That's the speculation coming from a number of researchers. Another interesting aspect about this case is two days after Ron Sullivan's sighting, and actually the same day as Gary had his accident, April 6, Australia would have its most famous and widely viewed encounters of all times, which was, of course, the Westall High School UFO landing in Melbourne, Australia, which was witnessed by 200, 300 students and teachers. So that is a weird correlation there. The fact that that case does have landing traces, I think, really strengthens the credibility. Hard to say for sure whether the accident that followed that case is directly related to it or not. It sure looks like it, given that it occurred in the very same location. I don't know, but what an unusual and tragic case. And here's another case, which is just beyond bizarre. I don't know that I've heard of this one before, so when I ran across it, I was like, wow, people should know about this. I call this one the UFO and the Bloodmobile. Now, there are a lot of cases where UFOs are attracted to certain locations or areas or activities. We know this, that there are UFO attractors, such as mines or graveyards or installations. And there are a lot of cases where UFOs seem to be attracted to vehicles, particularly vehicles carrying unusual cargo. And I think that may be what happened in this case, which took place on March 5, 1967, in the Ohio Valley in Ohio. So, here we go. It's quite a case. This case, from researcher John Keel, has got to be one of the weirdest on records. There were two witnesses, an anonymous nurse, and 21-year-old medical worker, Bo Scherzer. Again, it was the night of March 5, 1967, and the two of them had worked all day collecting blood donations from people in the area and were driving in their blood mobile along Route 2. This runs parallel to the Ohio River in the Ohio Valley, and they were on their way back to Huntington, Virginia. It's not known precisely where this encounter occurred, but according to the witnesses, it was a deserted part of the road with very little traffic. And this is when they both saw a flash of light in the woods over a small hill. This was at night. Seconds later, a large white glow appeared, rose slowly into the air, and then flew straight for their vehicle, clearly targeting their vehicle. And the nurse cried out, my God, what is it? And Bo replied, I'm not going to stick around to find out. And he pressed his foot down on the accelerator in an attempt to outrun the UFO. However, this object was determined to pace this vehicle, swooped right down over the bloodmobile and began to pace it. And Bo, who was driving, rolled down his window and looked up at it. And he was shocked and horrified to see some kind of weird extension being lowered from this glowing craft, which was really only a few feet above the bloodmobile, very low. And the nurse looked out the window on her side, and she saw another arm or extension coming from the craft, reaching down on her side, and she yelled out, It's trying to get us. So it looked to both of them like this UFO was trying to grab the blood mobile with sort of pincher-like devices. Bo continued driving as fast as he could, but no surprise, the object easily kept pace with their vehicle. This went on for only a few moments when suddenly they saw headlights from other cars approaching in the opposite direction. And this apparently aborted the encounter because as these other cars came near, the object retracted the two arm-like devices and darted off at high speed. But by this point, the two witnesses were near hysteria. They rushed directly to the police and reported what happened. This case did receive only minor press attention, but did catch the attention of John Keel, 
really a uh, mere coincidence, really, because following the encounter, Bo did not want to talk about it. He refused to give in any interviews at all. And as John Keel says, the case was told to me by the school teacher father of the witness, and he told me the story in front of his class. I have no reason to doubt the story, but I must explain that I have never been able to get the young man on the phone. I gather that he was pretty badly shaken up by the incident, which is hardly surprising. I found Bo's father in Point Pleasant. He was convinced his son was telling the truth, and says that he now refuses to drive along that highway, even in daylight. Well, I certainly don't blame him for that. And this was an area where there was a lot of activity. And of course, John Keel wrote the very well-known book, The Mothman Prophecies, about a, the activity that was going on in that area around that time. I wish we had more information on that case. John Keel did his best to interview the witness directly, but he didn't want to talk about it, which I can understand. The nurse involved in this case has never been located. Unfortunately, the main witness has passed away. So that case is pretty much going to stay where it's at for now, at least. But certainly an unusual case that deserves to be well known. And here's another case, which I call the bubble car UFO. I wanted to include this case because it's a very unusual description of a UFO craft seen very close up by a really good witness and was investigated by professional researchers, experienced researchers. So there's some reasons to believe that this is a highly credible case. But it's so unusual, and the figures inside this craft, once you hear their description, definitely it's the kind of case that makes you go, hmm. And I wanted to include it because I wonder about this case. Could this be our own craft, reverse engineered and piloted by humans, or are these ETs? Again, you can make up your own mind. This one occurred on August 1970, in Beer, Ireland. This very unusual case involves an anonymous gentleman known only as Mr. P. He's a farmer and former qualified mechanic, and he contacted UFO researchers Ann Griffin and Pat Delaney to share his very unusual UFO sighting, which took place in Burr. This is in County Offaly in Ireland. And he was bicycling home around 7 or 8 p.m., got about halfway home, when he saw a bright star-like object low in the sky and moving fast. And when he realized it was coming closer and actually slowing down, he got off his bike and stood watching the object. And after about a, a minute of observation, he started to feel some fear. And he says he actually became paralyzed with fear thinking that this object was coming for him. And it got closer and closer to him, and finally it just stopped and hovered. And he was able to clearly see its shape and what was inside of it. He says this looked like, quote, a bubble car. And you can see the illustration here. The center and bottom part was brown, and beneath it was a green light, which started revolving clockwise, but only when this object was stationary in the sky. He said it was totally silent, and the top section was perfectly clear, transparent, like a glass-like dome, a bubble. And he said it was close enough that he was able to clearly see inside, and what he saw absolutely astonished him. The interior was very simple, it was composed only of a central corridor, very narrow, and on either side were four armchair-style seats. There were four men on the right side and four women on the left side, all of them seated facing each other. And they were all human-looking, all in their early 20s, he estimates. They all wore what looked to him like military uniforms. He says the men were clean-shaven with tidy haircuts. They wore green, gray, army coats, it looked like, and the woman, he says, wore a military-style coat and skirts, and they had very neat, straight, shoulder-length hair. 
says it looked to him like they were all specifically chosen for this mission. Now, being a mechanic, he was especially interested in this craft itself. Did it have instrumentation and control panels? And no, he couldn't see anything like that. No controls, no panels, no antennas, nothing to explain how this object was able to move the way it did. And after just a few moments of watching this craft, it began to take off. And as it did, the green light beneath it sped it up its rotation. And then it turned from green to orange. And this object suddenly shot straight up at super high speed. And at this point, something very interesting happened. <laughs> Mr. P, instead of feeling intense fear, felt this strong wave of disappointment sweep over him. He realized he was hoping that the occupants would try to make contact with him, or actually take him. And it was a feeling, he said, that persisted for over a week. So was this ours? Were these normal people in there? Were these ETs? The witness obviously can't say. All he knows is that it was a very odd sighting. So that's a pretty brief case. It is a simple sighting, though. The witness did see humanoids. I found it interesting that his emotional reaction went from fear to wanting to go with them to being completely disappointed <laughs> that the encounter didn't go further than it did. So that is a very interesting aspect to that case as well. And here's another case, which is just off the charts odd. I call this one car cooked by an alien. There are a lot of cases of people who are driving along highways and encounter a UFO or an ET. There's no actual UFO in this case, just an ET, but some really unusual electromagnetic effects on this witness's car. This case took place on October 19, 1973, in the middle of a massive wave of humanoids across the United States and the world. This one took place outside of Ashburn, Georgia, and is a really interesting case, which although does involve a single witness in terms of what happened to her, there are apparently corroborating witnesses who also saw unusual activity. It was late at night as Mrs. Robinson, that's the, all, all we know about the witness, we do not know her first name, she was driving southbound on I-75, uh, just near Ashburn, Georgia, when suddenly and without warning, multiple systems on her car failed, including the engine itself, her brakes, her power steering, all of it. She did manage to pull onto the shoulder and was trying to figure out what was wrong when she became overcome by a, quote, strange feeling. And looking very slowly over to her left, outside the driver's side window, she was shocked and frightened to see a small humanoid standing next to the car. Now, she described this as being a, quote, four-foot-tall metal man who appeared to be wearing a metallic pewter-like outfit capped with a bubble or dome made of the same material. There were two openings for eyes. The slits were rectangular. If the window was down, I could have touched it. So it was right standing next to her car. I can only imagine how frightening that must have been. But she said this figure seemed almost robotic in its movements. Very strange looking because from the elbow down, the arms, she said, were very narrow and wrinkled and reminded her of a chicken's legs. And for the next five or six minutes, and that's a long time, this creature, this figure, walked around Miss Robinson's car. And as she says, the creature disappeared after walking from the right side of the car to the front and then around to the back. Now, she never saw any UFO, she says she didn't hear any weird noises, smell any odors of any kind. She was very reluctant to get out. She was quite frightened. But she looked in the rear view mirror and didn't see the creature. Now her engine still wasn't working and realizing that something was very wrong and fearing it might blow up, she actually got out of the car. 
She looked carefully around. There was no sign of the creature. She walked to the front of her car, raised the hood, hoping to attract the attention of another motorist. But as she did so, thick smoke came pouring out of the engine. Now, unfortunately for her, she had to wait for nearly an hour and a half before a Georgia state trooper showed up and called for a wrecker to tow the car. The car was towed to a mechanic who said that the hood of the car was so hot that it was nearly at the melting stage. And as Miss Robinson says, it was so hot and the metal so soft that it looked like you could poke your thumb through it, but the paint was not affected. So the engine, in fact, was so hot that the mechanic said he had to wait another hour and a half before he was able to even touch the engine. So that's, in total, three hours after this encounter with this strange robotic humanoid. And it seemed absolutely a unique encounter, but the Georgia State Trooper actually told Mrs. Robinson that there had been, quote, several other reports like hers from motorists that day. I do wish we had more information on that case. It's so unusual to... I mean, what happened to that lady's car? <laughs> Who knows? But a very unusual case in terms of the electromagnetic effects on the witness's vehicle, but also the description of the ET as well. I wonder if perhaps she had missing time. I don't know. She never saw a UFO. It's a really bizarre case. And here's another one that's just so weird. I call this one Stuck to the Wall by a UFO. And I don't know that I've ever heard anything quite like this. That's why I wanted to include this account in this collection because it's got some really unusual effects. I suspect this is more than just a sighting. But you can make up your own mind about it. This one took place in the fall of 1976 in Bangor, Ireland. UFOs can produce many strange effects, but this one is truly bizarre. This comes from researcher Jenny Randalls, and it involves an anonymous young man who was employed as a civil servant in Bangor, Ireland, and was babysitting his younger brother. Now, normally, his younger brother is very rebellious about going to bed, but strangely, and perhaps significantly, on this night, he went to bed on his own. Apparently that almost never happens, so that was strange, but things were about to get much stranger. For no reason that the witness could determine, the temperature in the house became stiflingly hot, even though the heater wasn't on. The witness went to the bathroom, and the high strangeness escalated, because he now noticed that the street sounds outside the house, which were very loud normally, because this was a busy street, but were now totally silent. So wondering what was going on, he opened the blinds to the bathroom window and was amazed to see a large white oval light hovering directly above the road. And as he stared at it, trying to find an explanation for what it might be, it suddenly started to grow in size. So perhaps it was growing in size or coming near to him. Either way, without warning, a beam of brilliant white light, as the witness says, the purest white light I've ever seen, came out of the UFO and moved very slowly towards him and then struck him. So again, a very unusual beam of light. He said he was blinded by its brilliance and now found himself being thrown back hard against the wall and stuck to it about one foot off the ground, just stuck there. He says he remained pasted to the wall, utterly paralyzed, unable to move, for at least 10 seconds. Though he says it felt longer than that. Uh, he saw lights flashing in front of his eyes during all of this. And the next thing he knew, he was sliding to the floor. He was still partially paralyzed. It took him a few moments to regain his senses and recover. But he did, and looking out the window, he now saw this light climbing into the sky at a 45 degree angle. And the next day, he went outside and saw a flattened circular patch of grass exactly where this object had hovered outside his window. 
definitely a very unusual case with a lot of unusual effects with the house heating up like it did as we saw in the previous case the kid being stuck to the wall by this beam of light but there's also landing traces and the fact that his little brother went to bed by himself without any complaint the witness thought that was unusual which makes me wonder was there some influence there going on it's certainly possible because sometimes people behave in ways that surprise them during a ufo encounter so there's always another case it always surprises me when people say ah where's the evidence you know i'm skeptical because there is a lot of evidence and you can dismiss one case or two or 20 or a hundred but the fact is there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands i mean we're again like i've said before approaching i think a million documented cases and it's probably a lot more than that so skeptics at this point don't really have a leg to stand on there are just far too many cases to ignore and here's another one which i call levitated by a ufo and this one is super unusual and really quite surprising i don't know that i've heard anything quite like it this occurred on february 12 1979 in headingley england and i like this case because although the witness is anonymous it was investigated by experienced researchers this is another short case but it's so incredibly odd i had to include it this case comes from very experienced researchers graham and mark birdsall it was around 6 p.m again on february 12 1979 as an anonymous railway employee had just exited a train to headingley but he got off and decided to walk the one mile alongside the track to his home now as seen here in figure a he was walking by the railroad tracks on his left and noticed a strange green glow at almost ground level on the other side of the two railroad tracks and in fact it was so low it was actually behind some bushes so as he's looking at it he first thought it might be stationary but as he walked he noticed that it was actually keeping pace with him there was snow all around and it reflected off the snow looking very eerie now at this point a train began to approach on his side so he had to cross the tracks to the other side and thus move much closer to this strange glowing green object and in fact when he crossed he was now only a few feet away from it and as the train went by this strange green mass rose up a few feet and then targeted him moving directly over his head so close it was only a few feet above him and wondering what it was he tried to reach out to touch it but couldn't quite reach it and as seen here in figure b uh, it was several feet wide seemed amorphous and then something extremely strange happened this railway employee found himself being pulled up vertically into the air levitated about six or seven feet and carried forward along the tracks about 15 feet in the direction he had been walking levitated up into the air and then suddenly set down so he was scared confused <laughs> he gathered himself and finally looked back at the object and now saw that it seemed to have grown in size and dimension and now appeared to be a more solid object sort of oval or triangular shaped it had a green glow coming from behind it a green mist surrounding it it looked solid but he rushed home and for a long time told nobody the only other effect of this encounter was that he decided to never walk along that track again and who can blame him yeah that case is so weird <laughs> i can only imagine what it must be like to be just walking along and then suddenly you find yourself floating in the air I guess the takeaway from that is if suddenly you find yourself levitating look up to see if there is a ufo overhead and i can't blame the witness for not wanting to take that pathway ever again because that would be certainly disconcerting to say the least 
Now, moving along to the next case, which I think of all the cases that I'm presenting today, this one has to be the oddest. This one is so strange. There are a lot of cases where people have communicated with ETs face to face, uh, have received telepathic messages of all kinds. This one is weirder than that. I call this one conversation with a UFO. And there's a lot to like about this case, which occurred on March 24, 1988, in Tetbury, England. I like it because the witness was very skeptical himself, didn't want to report it, finally felt compelled to. It was well researched. And the messages he got, this long conversation he had with this UFO, echo a lot of other cases. But as we shall see, it's got some really unusual elements to it. So what has to be one of the strangest UFO encounters on record comes from a 77-year-old man known only as Mr. R. He was afraid to report it at first because as he later told investigator Kevin Owens, it seems very improbable, and I was afraid of joining the ranks of the cranks. So he kept quiet for a few months, but changed his mind and said that his experience was, quote, the kind you investigate. And the investigator himself called it, quote, quite extraordinary. I agree, and I think you will too. So it was around 10.15 p.m., and Mr. R. looked out of his kitchen window of his home, located again in Tetbury, England, and saw a light about 900 feet away going across a field. And he thought for a second that this might be a shepherd rounding up sheep, which were quite numerous in this area. But he pretty quickly discarded that explanation because this object, whatever it was, was actually floating about 10 feet in the air and seemed to be crisscrossing this field in a weird scanning pattern. He says it was football shaped, around the same size, quite small. And although brilliantly lit, didn't seem to cast any light to the ground. It's again another thing we see in some of these UFO cases. Very unusual lights. So he was puzzled and curious, and he went out into his backyard, which actually slopes upward, and will give him a better view of the field and this object. So he goes out there, and when he reaches the wall at the edge of his property and looks into the field, this strange object is gone. Or so he thought, because suddenly, coming straight from above him, he was struck by a beam of light from this same object, which was now directly over him. So this really shocked him, and he instantly cried out, out loud, what's going on? Now he wasn't expecting a reply, but he got one anyway, and he ended up having a very interesting and quite lengthy conversation because it was a few seconds later, a strange voice replied, We are just observing your world. Now, per the witness, Mr. R, this voice sounded out loud, tinny and unnatural, almost as though it was coming through earphones. So it was apparently out loud, uh, but at this point, this is when the strange conversation began. Because Mr. R replied, told the UFO, he said, well, you've come to the wrong part to see anything. And the UFO replied, after a short delay, we know where you are. And Mr. R said, when you say we, who do you mean? Aliens or something? So again, after each question by Mr. R, there was a short pause, a delay, as if each response, he thought, required careful thought before being issued, or perhaps for another reason, as we shall see from the UFO's next response. So Mr. R said, when you say we, who do you mean, aliens or something? The UFO replied, no, no aliens here. What you see is a probe, similar to how your scientists send out to observe other planets. Mr. R replied, how can you understand me? The UFO said, Your voice is recorded on the probe and relayed to us for a reply. Mr. R said, Oh, that's clever, but I'm not sure what's happening. 
Why are you observing us? What's the matter? The UFO replied, You are gaining knowledge so fast and getting to the very basis of the structure of matter and you could cause untold harm if you don't know what you're doing. Mr. R replied, Well, I don't know about that. I'm not a scientific man. I suppose it makes some sense. The UFO replied, If your species doesn't learn some sense, we will have to take measures against you. Mr. R replied, What do you mean? Are you going to exterminate us? The UFO said, No, nothing like that. We'd have to take action to reduce your activities. Mr. R replied, Could you do that? The UFO said, Oh yes, easily. It wouldn't take much to upset your order of things. Mr. R replied, What would you propose to do then? The UFO said, You are very susceptible to bacteria and viruses. Something like that would cause disorganization. Mr. R said, You could in introduce this into our world? The UFO said, Yes, of course. Mr. R said, How will we know it's you? And the UFO said, You won't know. We don't propose to tell you. Mr. R said, Where are you operating from? Where are you? The UFO said, Well, you're not clever enough to understand that, are you? Mr. R said, I quite agree. I'm not an astronomer. Do you come from far away? The UFO said, Well, quite a distance. Mr. R said, Are you in what we call our solar system? And the UFO said, We may be. Mr. R said, Farther afield? The UFO replied, We may be. There's no point in asking such questions. Mr. R said, What is really the problem? How come you are allowing it to go on? Why not just nip it in the bud? The UFO said, Explain what you mean by nip it in the bud. Mr. R said, Alter it before it gets too far advanced. And the UFO replied, Oh yes, we could do that. So, Mr. R was prepared to ask more questions, but at this point, and without warning, the glowing craft disappeared and the conversation ended. It really left him quite shook up, and he wondered at first if this might have been some secret U.S. aircraft from the nearby Kemble Base airfield, about seven miles away. But reviewing all the high strangeness of it, he decided that this was probably an actual UFO and felt compelled to report it. And he told investigators that he was able to remember this conversation in quite some detail because it was so unusual. I think you'll agree that case is incredibly odd, but certainly <laughs> worth knowing about. And once again, yeah, it's not at all unusual that people get messages about how we are treating each other, our, ourselves, and the planet itself. So that is a common theme. And certainly the investigators felt this was a legitimate case. And now we get to the last case for this episode. This is one I personally investigated. It is in my book, Humanoids in High Strangeness. So if you want to learn more about it, you can certainly check that out. I call this one, Something That Shouldn't Exist. This is a direct quote from the witness who saw a very unusual humanoid. It's quite an unusual encounter. And this one occurred quite recently, February 2013, in Richmond. This is in British Columbia, Canada. And as we shall see, it's a very unusual sequence of events leading up to an incredible and very close encounter with a super strange humanoid. It was a cold night in February 2013 when 21-year-old Corey, this is a pseudonym, and his friend, who I call Devin, were hanging out at the dike at the end of Blundell Road, pictured here, where they often went to sit and talk. And they were having this profound conversation about God and the meaning of life, really heavy-duty philosophical subjects. And as Corey says, we both wish to see something. Lo and behold, it appeared. 
Suddenly, without warning, an uncanny silence pervaded the environment as this fiery orange-red-yellow object appeared and approached them at about treetop level, very low, and it was large. According to Corey, this object appeared to be about 70 feet wide and was no more than 50 feet overhead, he estimates. And as Corey says in his own words, it chose to investigate us. It came so close to me and my friend, I wondered if it was physically affecting our bodies. It filled the sky directly above us. It covered the entire 25-foot width of the dike and stretched beyond that. The color was incredible. I have never, ever in my life seen anything like it. Up close, it looked like liquid plasma. It felt so weird to be near it. It was so strange. It was so surreal. And as they watched, this orange-red yellow object shrunk down to a six-foot wide green and pink sphere surrounded by mist. It started to move away, so both of them took off and actually chased this object down Blundell Road to number one road seen here and watched as this object moved and hung directly over the Grower Elementary School. And both of them had the impression it was watching them and showing itself to them intentionally. They were overcome emotionally by all this, so they fled back to Corey's house. It's pretty late at night at this point. At this point, Corey heard in his head telepathically this almost angelic voice saying, be prepared. Be prepared. So they were making a lot of noise and didn't want to wake up the other occupants of the house. And they went back outside, walked out to the field by the school, and saw that this craft was now hovering over the water. They actually saw the Canadian Coast Guard underneath it and heard rounds of ammunition going off. It appeared to them that the Coast Guard was actually shooting at this object. This absolutely freaked them out. They began screaming at the top of their lungs, trying to wake up the neighbors. Though weirdly, nobody seemed to hear them. Nobody came out. But the weirdness just escalated. They saw several strange orbs of light rising up from behind this craft. Nearby, they saw another large, what looked like a triangular-shaped craft, hovering pretty low. Overwhelmed, they decided it was time to go home. And they were walking by the monkey bars at the field at Grower Elementary School, pictured here. And these monkey bars were right on their left. And this is when they saw something they could hardly believe. And I'll just quote Corey directly. As he says in his own words, We saw a being covered entirely in black sitting upside down on the monkey bars. The height was about four feet tall the same as a toddler. It was just a general shape and appearance, with what appeared to be the outline of a head, one-third the height of the body. It was completely black, the size of a toddler with a huge head. It was simply gazing at us. So this figure was so close, only four feet away, but its appearance and its behavior were so bizarre, it was really hard for them to process what they were seeing. As Corey says, again in his own words, it looked like it was bending light around it. There is a black paint on the market called Vanta Black that absorbs about 98% of light. This was absorbing over 100%. I can't explain it. It was like it was sucking the light into its clothing. Now at this point, the creature actually reached out and tried to touch Corey's hand. And that was enough for him and his friend Devin, because as Corey says, we both panicked and ran away. I was so close to touching something that shouldn't exist. How wild is that? So if this affected them both very profoundly, and in fact, Corey's friend Devin, his mental health began to decline rapidly to the point that Corey decided to break off the friendship and Corey himself said he was very profoundly affected. He could hardly stand seeing that color, the red-orange color, as it would bring him back to the incident and cause all kinds of emotions. 
And he also started to look back on many weird experiences he had as a kid, where he would see weird beings in his bedroom. Often, this being would come and stare into his face from only inches away. And sometimes it would take on the appearance of his brother or one of his parents. He says it always came from the closet. He started having out-of-body experiences. He would see visions of alien faces, weird planets, weird languages. He developed an ability for art. He started getting telepathic messages. In fact, one message told him that he himself was not fully human. So these experiences continued. At age 15, he once woke up to find himself paralyzed, unable to move, and his room was filled with blue light. In 2012, he saw a close-up craft with his girlfriend, soon to be his wife. But it was really his 2013 experience which changed everything for him. Because as Corey says, since then, I have seen many orbs, shadow figures sometimes, and had visitations and feelings of strange presences in my room. I think things have been contacting me for years, but I keep being scared. I feel like I am being watched and observed, and they are waiting for the correct time to interact. So he's still searching for answers. As he says, all the things I've seen and experienced it has truly left me baffled. So he reached out to me uh, in search of answers and confirmation, consented to an interview, was quite excited to be interviewed. And again, his case does appear in my book, Humanoids in High Strangeness, 20 True Encounters. And there's quite a bit more to it than I've presented here. So if you're interested, you can definitely check that out. That case, like all cases, have volumes to teach us. I thought it was really interesting how profoundly the witnesses were affected by it. And it's always interesting to me when witnesses struggle to find the words to describe what they've seen, uh, because that t to me is adds to the level of credibility, because it's very difficult to describe a UFO encounter when you're suddenly confronted with something that's completely out of your worldview. It's hard to describe. And when you are changed that profoundly uh, by your encounter, well, that is not unusual, but it certainly speaks to the credibility of a case and how impactful a UFO encounter can be. So that's it for today. 10 cases all the way from the 1930s to 2013, a span of more than 100 years involving quite a few witnesses. I mean, what's that 20, 30 people in just this episode alone, alone who are reporting unusual activity? So again, I'm just going to underline it. Skeptics really need to start doing their research because you could dismiss every single one of these cases if you want, but there's another 10 to replace it. And if you dismiss those, there's another 10. So it's time that everyone starts taking this subject more seriously it's clear this is happening. Uh, the physical evidence is undeniable. You can try to explain it away, but I think it's pretty obvious what we're dealing with here are extraterrestrials. Perhaps not every single case can be explained in that way, but I think we have enough cases of humanoids and craft with portholes and ETs coming out and leaving footprints and so forth to say that yes we are not alone there are other people out there very much like us and they're almost always humanoids so that's our episode for today i want to thank you once again for watching it's always appreciated and until next time keep asking questions keep searching for the truth and most important of all keep having fun bye for now